Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andy McAfee. I'm a scientist at MIT, and I am the moderator for this session on a deeply important topic, which is how are we going to accelerate this process of closing the skills gap that we see over and over again around the world. And our colleagues at the World Economic Forum have set up an interesting accelerator model in 23 countries around the world to do exactly that, to accelerate the process of giving people the right skills, the right training, and closing the skills gap. Uh, we have five panelists with us today who are in the middle of that transition, in the middle of that process, and we want to hear from all of them. They are Ms. Maria Jose Abud, who is the Vice Minister of Women and Gender Equality in Chile, Mr. Gias Udin Khan, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Engro Corporation in Pakistan, uh, Ms. Zainab Bodor Okai, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Kale Holdings and the co-chair of the Turkey Closing the Skills Gap Accelerator, uh, Mr. Peter Hummelgard, who is the vice, who is the minister for employment in Denmark, and Dr. Hong Chuan Naran, who is the minister of education, youth, and sports in Cambodia. Uh, Ms. Abud, could we start with you? The accelerator in Chile has been up for a while. Can you tell us what steps and priorities are being set to ensure the the continued success and the sustain, and the sustainability of this program? And I'm sorry, I, we, I think you're on mute still. I'm, I'm there. Okay, so thank you, are. Andrew. Good morning and good evening to all the panelists. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to share the experience of this accelerator in Chile. Let me first quickly explain what does this accelerator do. That is called the Gender Parity Initiative, which is a community of organizations committed to reduce the gender gap in the labor market based on innovative public-private innovation. To be part of this community, we ask companies to go through a self-assessment to identify their biggest gender gaps. They measure the percentage of women in high management position, gender weight gap, protocols to address gender-based violence gen between other indicators. Then, based on this self-assessment, we help them to develop an action plan tailored to their needs. These action plans include goals to reduce the gender gap in, for example, recruitment process, promotion of women in leadership positions, and how to life work balance and share responsibilities with between men and women. In the last five years, with the support of the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Economic Forum, this accelerator has become the, a powerful network of 109 member companies, which make it the largest gender parity initiative in the region and one of the largest in the world. Despite the challenge of the pandemic, we have continued growing. 25 new companies joined this initiative last year, and 16 have been recently certified with the highest standard of gender equality in the workplace. But going to your question, what has made this initiative so successful? First, we have ensured to speak the language of the private sector, outlining the right incentives. Going to this accelerator is not about justice or ethics, but have to be and have to be understood like a smart business move that benefits the, the company in the long run and it goes beyond corporate social responsibility. As the studies and uh, the academic studies have shown that gender equality benefits productivity and innovation of companies. Also very important, this model is built on international best practices and we create existing networks that bring concrete benefit to companies. They become part of a community where they have the opportunity to exchange information and work with relevant industry actors. In addition, being part of this accelerator is highly regarded by the community that increasingly de demands our society a strong commitment towards gender equity. 
just to show some concrete benefits, when we look to the indicators of companies that are part of this accelerator, we see that they are above the natural average in terms of some uh, gender quality indicators. For example, companies of this accelerator have a higher proportion of women in leadership position. They have on average approximately 26% of female representation on boards. Meanwhile, our national average is around 10%. In the same sense, when we look to the gender weight gap, uh, the, the average of these companies is 7%. Meanwhile, the national average is 27%. And just quickly, I would like to go through some lessons that can be very useful for other accelerators in terms of ensuring sustainable and continuous progress. First, we, we think and it is very necessary to get the right incentives across. We believe that sustainable success lies in making sure that the accelerator model moves and goes beyond political will and become a must do for companies. Not because they need to tick the gender box, but because they see the benefit that brings to the organizational culture, employees' performance and to their bottom lines. This initiative cannot be part of a human resources strategy. It needs to be part of their business strategy model. And also, for the model to be sustainable, it needs to gain full organizational ownership from high execu executives. This is why we have been focused in the last time, last uh, month, on promoting territorial engagement and meetings with industry representatives and business associations from around the country, because we need to uh, en engage the high executive in this uh, in this accelerator. Also, we need to generate trust in our initiative. Many times companies are afraid to look at themselves to do this self-assessment because they are scared of the gaps that they may find and also the use of the data. So we ensure confidentiality and the right use of the information. This data is only used to create um, their tailored action plan and to generate aggregate indicators never to show that at the company level. And lastly, we need to be creative to create a strategic partnership with key actors to increase the impact of this accelerator model. International collaboration is very crucial to make, to to make sure to have an active and dynamic cooperation with organizations such as the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Economic Forum, of course, but also with organizations as UN Women, with foreign chambers of commerce, and especially with other gender parity initiative in, in the region, in Latin America, to share best, best practices and also to promote collaborative growth. So that is a, a very resume of what is our accelerator. Thank you very much for the organizer for this event, for this invitation, and we look forward for to promote this initiative and to exchange ideas with the international community. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Khan, could we go to you? In Pakistan, the, your accelerator has identified more than 100 roles that need reskilling upskilling and new skilling. And I understand that you've created dedicated skills programs to help uh, accomplish that task. Can you tell us a bit about that, what's been achieved so far and what you've learned? Yeah, greetings to everyone from Engro and Pakistan and thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity. Uh, so, th so the area that I'm gonna focus on uh, in terms of uh, the skills development program that we have undertaking, uh, undertaken is agriculture. And that is because of an importance that it holds not only for the region, but also for Pakistan. So even if you look at the, look at the South Asian region, uh, it, uh, the 23% of the world's population uh, lives in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. 17% uh, of the GDP of those uh, of these countries is contributed uh, through agriculture. It employs about 39% of the population. But more importantly, uh, 15, more than 15% of the people uh, living in these countries are undernourished. And, and there are essentially three reasons, uh, 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 three areas where uh, investments are necessary, whether it's increase in farming practices, 
uh, whether it is to efforts to improve agricultural yields and at the same time to train the people uh, so they are ready for skills that will be required for tomorrow. In Pakistan, uh, the story is very, very similar to the region. Uh, we've got about 40% of our people who are involved in the agriculture sector. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, more than 20% of the people uh, living here are uh, undernourished. Uh, the number is uh, even worse when it comes to children who've got stunted growth, over 45%. And uh, if we look at the overall uh, productivity in the agriculture sector, our crop yields are roughly 25 to 60 percent worse off uh, than some of the other developed countries. And essentially, there have been three problems that that we've been able to identify. Uh, number one is obviously suboptimal uh, resource utilization. That's uh, mainly because of poor skill sets and absence of uh, farm mechanization and very slow adoption to modern technologies. We are, unfortunately, our R&D spend is extremely low. It's only 0.24% of, uh, of GDP. And there is tremendous lack of financial inclusion when it comes to access, of, access to credit to particularly our, our smaller farmers. And, and hence, what we've been able to identify, the three solutions that we've been able to identify are, number one, um, innovative using innovative farming techniques, uh, higher level of mechanization and, and, and farm operations and use of modern technology. And, and clearly, uh, what it requires us to do is to massively upskill, uh, reskill and introduce new skills to, to the entire uh, labor force which is involved with the agriculture sector. And I must thank uh, uh, World Economic Forum over here because through the partnership with Punjab Skills Development Fund, Punjab being our, our largest uh, province uh, population-wide, uh, we we've been able to set up the Skills Accelerator program. It comprises of uh, business leaders from different sectors, um, a company like Engro. Uh, we are focused mostly towards agriculture. We have been able to identify 24 roles uh, which are now going to focus on skills which will be required for the future. Essentially, it is it is important not just from the perspective of future proofing our workforce, but also uh, keeping into perspective the requirements in terms of uh, managing our food security. So thank you to the World Economic Forum. Uh, it has been a very positive start and and we hope that it's going to answer it's 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 going to help us address. Uh, some of the key problems that we're facing right now. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I particularly want to thank both of our opening speakers for keeping their remarks both fascinating and on time. As I say, we have a packed agenda and we really appreciate everybody uh, helping us out to finish and, and accomplish all of our goals on time. Um, Ms. Okie, let me turn to you. Um, you're working closely with both public and private partners in Turkey to close the skill gap. Wh what have you learned? How has the accelerator helped so far? And what are your targets? What would you like to see accomplished in the next chunk of time? Thank you, uh, Dr. McAfee. Um, I would like to start by thanking the other panelists uh, for their insights, first of all. Let me begin by answering the second part of the question first. What is the target of the Accelerator Initiative? Our target is clear, create systems and structures that can sustain themselves, supported by public-private cooperation, uh, cooperation, whose uh, main goals are identifying the needs, processes, and solutions on reskilling and upskilling in order to better equip the workforce for the future of the economy and the world. So these mechanisms, mechanisms must employ policies and practices that are built on the following three pillars, SDGs, digitalization, and innovation. The Accelerator Initiative kicked off in Turkey as of this year, so it is fair to say that we are at the beginning just of a multi-year journey. Our goal uh, is very challenging and not easy to achieve, and I believe that the only way we can succeed is uh, with a multi-stakeholder approach, as you mentioned, and a strong pub public-private uh, cooperation. 
uh, we are working diligently in the first phase where we are conducting a system analysis to identify the current shortcomings, barriers, and gaps uh, in both uh, the public policies, institutions, and mechanisms, as well as uh, those the private sector employs independently. In the months ahead, upon the completion of this analysis with our partners, we are going to discuss the path forward to, to bring forth a comprehensive agenda and expand our community by contract contacting other stakeholders to take part in the initiative under specific agenda items. Later, we will create a working group to focus on separate uh, these specific agenda items. Uh, upon the completion of the working groups, we will ask our partners and others to commit to action uh, to actions that working group have suggested. So lastly, uh, we will track these commitments and continue to monitor uh, how these commitments have ameliorated uh, the status quo. I also would like to share a few facts with you that might help explain the potential of the accelerated initiative in Turkey. So a study, con a study conducted last year revealed that 7.6 uh, million jobs will be lost un until 2030 in Turkey. But in return, there will be 8.9 million new jobs created in the same period in similar fields. Moreover, the study further highlights that an additional 1.8 million jobs and in professions that do not exist current, currently will also be created. This puts out, uh, out a net increased potential of 3.1 million jobs, most of which um, will definitely require different set of skills than what we, the workforce, uh, workforce in Turkey mainly possesses today. So digital literacy uh, will be a key variable in this regard, as the skills uh, needed for these new professions will mostly include the tech abilities. The role of entrepreneurship is also very critical, I believe, as a portion of the potential is likely to be uh, employed by new companies operating in these uh, yet to be seen uh, spaces. Uh, this very significant uh, potential, uh, coupled with Turkey's young population, dictates that opportunities should not and cannot go uncaptured. With the accelerator's success, we can work to help realize these numbers mm -hmm. and perhaps even more. As a private business owner, I'd like to underline that public policies on employment and the workforce must utilize AI and other digital tools, not just for increasing productivity in the workplace, must also for supporting social cohesion and social needs. Uh, private sector must also support public policies with matching policies and actions of its own and also a challenge I also challenge my own colleagues to go toward this goal. Public policies must be built so that they can utilize real-time data to adapt to sudden changes and shocks to the workforce and the economy as we experience. The challenges and inequalities in access to education must be identified and resolved. This is crucial for closing the skills gap. We have to provide equal opportunity to every every member of the society using new technologies, changes in curriculums, and providing the needs uh, needed infrastructure. Inclusions of women, for particularly young women, uh, in the re, um, uh, re and upskilling processes will also be crucial element of addressing systemic change. Turkey has had experiences uh, in the recent past with the initiatives to empower women in STEM, and these efforts must strengthen, obviously, exponentially moving forward. So these are my thoughts, and thank you for this invitation. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Himmel, Mr. Hummelgaard, uh, you're our representative from an educational ministry. Um, tell us what, what you have learned about the, what's, what we need for a successful, a fruitful collaboration between the public and the private sector around this broad issue of reskilling and training for the jobs of tomorrow. Well, thank you so much. And uh, also uh, a, a very big thanks, not only to the World Economic Forum, but also for uh, to the other panelists for insightful remarks. Uh, first of all, just, just add that I'm, I'm the Minister of Employment uh, and, uh, and not from an uh, educational ministry. However, we do work a lot with the upskilling and reskilling of especially uh, not only employed, but also unemployed people. And I think basically um, th there's an old Chinese proverb that says that if you're planning for a year, sow rice. If you're planning for a decade, plant trees. And if you're planning for a lifetime, educate people. So in other words, education and uh, upskilling requ requires long-term commitment and uh, also substantial funding. 
Uh, all to that, ensuring that our workers have the right skills is to me one of the most important tasks for politicians all around the world at, at this moment. And we really think uh, from a Danish perspective that we have a unique opportunity after the pandemic to invest in reskilling. In Denmark, we have uh, invested more than uh, 260 million euro since 2020 through a number of initiatives. And just to mention a few, we have invested in, in up to two years of vocational training on higher unemployment benefits uh, so that unskilled unemployed persons will, uh, will get 110% uh, in unemployment benefits if they commit themselves to a, a longer term uh, educational uh, program in one of the areas where where we have uh, where we also have lack of uh, of employment at the moment, uh, and we have seen a rise in vocational training after the possibility to receive higher benefits was introduced. Second of all, we have made massive investments in short vocational training through regional programs with the job focus. And during the pandemic, the Danish government has concluded 17 tripartite agreements with the social partners. And that is also an answer to your direct question, because that is a di direct partnership with, with both the, the uh, employer side and the worker side uh, in, uh, in, uh, in actually making investments in, in short vocational training and, and also making sure that, uh, that we can assist businesses and workers through the crisis. And one of the important tripartite agreements concerns students and apprentices working at companies in a difficult situation. And that aim is to give them essential education and training as the demand was low during the pandemic. And we have also invested further in the local public coordinators, bringing together local job centers, education centers, social partners and local businesses in order to identify the, the needs in the work market. And the aim is to make it easier for companies to get qualified employees and make it easier for the job centers to get unemployed persons reskilled. And this is an excellent example of, of public-private partnerships. And my experience is that we need to collaborate with the employers as well as the, the workers. So just let me conclude by saying that, that Denmark has a proud tradition for reskilling. And this has only been possible due to the committed engagement from the social partners and the state in a tripartite collaboration. And such partnerships are the necessary key, we believe, to ensure that, that we provide workers with the needed skills and that we can actually at least try and plan for a, a lifetime. So thank you. Thank you. And I would like to remind all of our participants today and everybody who's listening that they have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists via Slido. I think we're all familiar with how to do that. So please feel free. Um, Post your questions. Please keep them short and please keep them relevant to the content of this session. But we would love to hear what's on your mind. Uh, Dr. Narone, if we could close out with you, I think our timing is excellent because I understand that Cambodia is launching its, its accelerator with the forum today. Could you talk a bit about what your goals for it are and what you think will be critical for its success in the future? Uh, thank you. Uh, greeting from Cambodia. I wish to thank all the panelists for the insights. And I think that, you know, for the successful uh, initiative, I think uh, we need to have an ecosystem uh, of uh, schools, universities, uh, policies, private sector working together, uh, and also how to make education responsive to the and training uh, to the needs of the private sector. Uh, I would like to share some of the thought that what we are trying to do and how we can use that model to, you know, together with the uh, WF initiative to make it work. I think firstly, uh, government policy and school reform are necessary to develop soft skill needed by the private sector. So, you know, we sometimes it's very difficult to plan for skill development, but at least 
uh, they have to build strong foundation of the skill, foundation skill for, for the young people, and especially the soft skill. So uh, we embark on education reform by piloting the new generation schools, creating school environment for STEM education, use of new teaching methods such as collaborative learning, critical thinking, to promote uh, metacognitive skills, and self-regulated capabilities using active learning, student-centered approach, uh, and, and, and especially uh, for the student to become a lifelong learner and committed uh, to, uh, to, to relearn uh, the skill. Uh, and I think it works, and now we are, we are uh, gradually investing in order to roll it out. Uh, secondly, I think we must have a flexible curriculum uh, to link to career path. Uh, uh, which is the student, you know, provide opportunity uh, to participate in study clubs and also to have extracurricular activities uh, such as, you know, robotics, computer coding, creative writing, so that they can develop specific skill which they have special purpose for. And secondary education must be linked to high education. And students uh, should have opportunity to listen to experts, have access to career counseling so that they can make, you know, uh, like orientation toward the job market. Thirdly, school and universities as a hub within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, a platform for competition to link education to the real world. I think competition is crucial to develop grids and also the ability to compete in the real world. It also promotes inquiry, problem-solving skill. Students learn by observing orders, uh, build self-confidence and, and self-efficacy. If uh, they can do it, I also can do it. Uh, fourthly, business model accelerator competition with the participation of the private sector uh, is useful for students to learn how to solve the challenges uh, facing Cambodia. This should include training session on leadership, key concept of entrepreneurship to young people with drive and determination to turn their motive, innovative idea into viable business model. And then the winning team can receive funds to grow their ideas toward incubation and startup, which is we train students to create their own job. You know, they don't need, you know, for other people to create uh, their job, but also to think how to, you know, how to solve problem uh, facing society and especially to use digital technology. I think the young people, they, they are smart on that. So what, what they need is an ecosystem, also a platform. Fifthly, university business sector linkages to promote joint project and research. So we have that initiative. I think, I think it's, it's worked very well. It's a win-win and long-term collaboration uh, for, you know, for R&D present. Uh, and, and I think the private sector, they, they, they can contract uh, our uh, university and we invest in those that work well, uh, so that, you know, uh, the university work help private sector uh, because mostly our SME to solve their, their technology problem. And the private sector and university also benefit uh, for using that fund to grow, uh, to train people and to grow their, their research uh, and, and, and also uh, their capacity. Uh, and I, I believe that, you know, the national level partnership uh, that we are, we are trying to promote now because we just uh, have joined it. I think uh, number one is to establish you no know, public-private data sharing initiative to share data, to talk and find it out, and how school and university address those uh, skill that the private sector need uh, sharing. The uh, I think the demand and supply side. You know, trying to to uh, balance that. Number two is to the capacity to respond uh, to, to to develop upskill policy to respond to the need. Uh, thirdly, I think that continue to update the curriculum to address the changing nature of the workforce and also the evolving needs of the uh, of the economy, which need more and different skills such as STEM and, and other skills. We, all, we must also you know, explore the private sector partnership to, to develop models of upskilling that works, you know, have to look at what works and and try to invest more on what on what works, and 
promote lifelong learning, and I think that you know uh, it is important that uh, the, the student themselves are, are committed, but also supported by not just policy but also incentive. So incentive provided to the business, incentive provided to the workers to make a net, and more importantly, I think that uh, do we need you know long degree? You know, sometimes I think the students uh, spend a lot of you know time uh, studying, but we have to maybe look at innovative, flexible, micro-credential model, you know? So you, you don't need, you don't need big, you know, big, uh, big degree, but you need small part and like a, a credit base. So, so uh, I think that training and, you know, focus on uh, including online, micro, low cost, but knowledge intensive credential model that, that respond better to the changing needs of the economy. Uh, basically, you know, and I think that online would be would be great. Uh, now we 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 uh, you know uh, online can have a lot of access and also good for the young people. Uh, but but the problem also for the rural area that they don't have access to the internet and also technology. You know, basically, I think those are you know uh, are the uh, what we have tried to respond. I think it's not easy. You know, it's not easy to respond to the needs. To be frank, you know, because. The economy is changing fast, and the education, you know, lag behind. So how to make that? And I think that the student themselves must be smart, you know, train them to be smart, and then so that they can also uh, uh, help to, to address that problem. So thank you, and I believe that with sharing this idea, we can learn a lot, you know, from, from, from all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a question that's come in for Mr. Khan. Uh, the question is, how important is the role of the private sector in tackling challenge, the challenges that are traditionally associated with government? Uh, and what initiatives are, are you seeing in Pakistan that are, that are working here? So, so the role of the private sector is, uh, is extremely important because uh, at the end of the day, uh, so, so even if you look at even if you look at the accelerator program that we're currently working in th six different sectors, whether it's financial services, information and communication technology, manufacturing, hospitality and retail services, textile, agriculture, uh, what you see over here is that it's the it's the private sector which will be the biggest beneficiary or will have the biggest loss in, if they don't invest in upskilling people at the right time. So, uh, for example, for us, uh, because we are focusing on agriculture, we've picked up about 24 roles. And, and, and uh, out of that, we are doing pilots on about three of them. Uh, it, let me share an example with you of a crop advisor who is a skilled professional who provides customized solutions, technical advisory, and related marketing so services uh, to farmers who can uh, and and help them improve their yields and and this service is targeted to be provided to uh, all small farmers which are about 90 percent of the total farmer population in Pakistan so uh, to expect government to do this work alone uh, uh, well it's uh, a I don't think it will be possible Whoa. I think uh, the biggest beneficiaries of skill development apart from the country itself is the private sector and hence a very very active role is required uh, from all of us so yeah that's it that that one is pretty clear fantastic thank you uh, vice minister abud a question for you were there any policy changes that the government did in chile to accompany the efforts of the private sector in closing the economic gender gap <laughs> Well, thank you, Andrew. Well, we, we always say that as a Minister of Women and Gender Equality, we need to work with the private sector. The uh, uh, Closing the gender gaps, it's so important that if we don't have the commitment of the private sector, we cannot achieve the goals that we, we really need to achieve. And the, in this pandemic, we have seen that there have been, a, a, of course, a negative impact on employment on women and men, but we have seen that the impact have been bigger on employment of women. So what we have been doing is a, a, a series of, of different policies to uh, recover the loss of employment. And here the accelerator model have a crucial role because we need that commitment of companies. Now uh, our society demands for companies to be involved in gender issues. 
And to, to have a, a different uh, results, we need uh, different ways to do things on um, organizations. So what we have been doing is working on different plans, especially to increase the participation rate of employment of women in sectors that they traditionally haven't been, and they are crucial in this uh, reactivation uh, 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 state of economy, like uh, electricity, city, esteems, areas that in Chile we have a low rate participation as in all the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. So we have been doing like um, special plans for sectors that are important for the recovery, that we have a low participation of women and that we need to have women in that uh, places. And for that, it's, it's very important accelerator because what we do is to work with action plans, specifics, for each organization of how they, in, in, in uh, looking at their uh, gender gaps, can have realistic plans of how, of how they can increase women participation and also to uh, improve uh, the opportunities and the um, environment in, in the organization that helps women to um, be part of the uh, workforce. And that includes, of course, to have more flexibility and to be able to um, have some tools that are important to women to come to the um, workplace like uh, childcare. And that is what we have been working with the private sector. Thank you very much. Um, Vice Minister Abud, you brought up the pandemic, and that leads to a question that's been on my mind. Uh, we are all acutely aware that for the past year and a half, we have been dealing with a devastating global pandemic that has shifted and changed the skill base probably a great deal in all of your countries. So let me ask an open question, and I'd, I'd love a volunteer for this one. What what have the main insights been from this really challenging period that we've been living through. And how has the pandemic changed your view of what we need to do, the skills that are necessary and how we're going to close that skills gap? How are we thinking about that differently than we were a year and a half ago? And I, I'd love to hear from any of our panelists. Please don't be shy. May I? You may, please. Yes, uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the pandemic forced us to learn new technology, such as digital technology. You know, our teacher, you know, they work hard to embrace uh, that change. Uh, uh, and I, I think that digital skill is more important now. And I think that the business, you know, after COVID, you know, if you take a longer time, it would mean that reduce traveling, but more technology-based businesses uh, will be promoted. And I think that uh, it will change the way we are doing things uh, after, you know, before and after. It means that, you know, it more focus on uh, uh, maybe, you know, more uh, distant, uh, distant exchange, but we safe. It's more efficient, you know, like we don't have to travel. So it will impact travel industry. It will impact, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the tourist industry. But, you know, you will see that uh, businesses with digital technology, you know, with online technology will prosper. And it changed the way a business model uh, operating in, in all over the world. And I think that, that would, we, have to, we have to prepare for that change. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for that. Any of our other panelists on this topic? Yeah, just a few remarks. Please. That's okay. Yeah. Well, well just two points. Uh, I would say in, in Denmark, for, for many years, also after the financial crisis, we have had a, a very high employment rates also among uh, many of our unskilled uh, workers. And we've been trying for several years to see how can how can we uh, make sure that they have the skills that are needed in the labor market within the next five, 10, uh, and, and maybe even 20 years. And we've had a lot of, of, um, of uh, problems actually, you know, making it attractive to people who are in employment, have their, you know, their paychecks and they have their mortgages to pay and their children to feed to actually go back on the school bench. So what we tried to do during the pandemic was that to combine two problems at the same time. We saw that a lot of especially uh, unskilled workers lost their jobs during the pandemic. And so we made this scheme, which I talked about before, that the 
percent uh, uh, unemployment benefits for actually taking on a voca longer vocational training program in some of the key areas where we know we lack um, uh, trained people at the moment, and that being industrial technicians, that being plumbers, electricians, mm -hmm. and you name it. Uh, so we made a short list of, of uh, I think, around 40 to 50 types of, of uh, educations where we said that if you if you start these, this education now, you will receive 110% unemployment benefit for taking on that education and during the education. So that, that has made uh, uh, some progress. And then I would say the, the, the second thing that we have learned during the, the pandemic is that it has accelerated our need for educated and trained people. Uh, we can see now when we look at how the structures in the labor market are, um, are, are uh, placing itself after the pandemic, that the need for skilled people are now even stronger than it was two or three years ago. And it will increasingly become stronger, especially among the vocational trained uh, uh, workers, because uh, you know in Denmark, we have set a very high target of limiting our uh, green grass emissions mm. uh, um, uh, um, um, until 2030, where we're going to uh, limit our uh, emissions by 70%. So we really have a hard drive on for, for the green transition. And to make the green transition work, you need electricians, you need plumbers, you need industrial technicians, and so forth. So we are really trying to accelerate the demands in our labor market, which we knew we had, but which is ever more evident after the pandemic that we have. Fantastic. Thank you. I think we have time to hear from one more of our panelists on this question. If anybody has a final contribution they would like to make. I would like to comment if, if it's possible. Please. Okay. Um, the most important aspect that the pandemic showed was the fact that much more can be achieved uh, in, you know, to work uh, from a distance also within the education. Uh, this is valid. But as I mentioned before, challenges and, um, and inequalities in access to education uh, must be identified and resolved. The ones who were uh, uh, prepared, uh, they did quite well in Turkey. The ones had a problem, infrastructure problem especially. Uh, had difficult time to um, adapt uh, but overall in education in uh, mega cities in big cities uh, both uh, in business and schools uh, the, uh, you know uh, we were quite adaptive and uh, uh, everything were working well, worked well and it was effective uh, another problem is manufacturing I'm working in the manufacturing industry and manufacturing was also highly impacted during the crisis we had to find innovative ways uh, to keep the factories open you know we had uh, supply chain problems during COVID and we had other issues and uh, you know we were trained to uh, work uh, in a certain manner uh, lean operations etc so everything has to had to change so either through arranging uh, worker schedules or automating processes was a difficult uh, process for all uh, industries and uh, especially manufacturing this led uh, to a need in increase in the number of uh, skilled workers but also in some cases an increase in number of workers overall because some workers who were in quarantine uh, couldn't work for example so uh, it was uh, very difficult so to be adaptive uh, was the key issue and uh, that uh, at the beginning was very difficult but uh, on the course of the pandemic everybody learned uh, how to react and when to react uh, so it is a process but it wasn't really uh, easy uh, for uh, uh, companies who are really uh, doing big scale uh, productions, et cetera. So that was a big challenge. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I would like to thank all of our panelists for, for being so clear and so informative and for helping us stay on time with this session. I think this might be a record for a World Economic Forum session that we're actually going to end exactly on time. I'm just I'm grateful to all of our panelists for that and for the insights they shared with us. I would like to remind all of our panelists and all of our audience members here today that they should feel free to share their insights and their learnings from this session and from all the other ones this week on social channels, on top link. And please keep in mind that we have a fantastic array of programming ahead, thanks to our colleagues at the forum uh, for the coming week. So please 
carve out some time, feel free, drop in, participate in these sessions, ask questions. Uh, the world that we are creating is changing very quickly and we need to stay on top of it. And I can't think of an area that's more important than making sure that our people have the skills that they need to be successful and to create thriving economies in this world that we're all building so quickly. So again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our hosts. And I would like to draw this session to a close. Thanks for being part of this.